Hi, it's Thomas Durkin, uh, creator of the WTFF blog. Right now I am here with Lou Howas, who is currently the guitarist for Material Issue. Lou, how are you doing tonight? <laughs> I'm good, Tommy. How are you? Doing good, doing good. Um, I guess straight up, everyone's going to want to know, how did you, of all people, get asked to be the uh, second guitarist for this final show of Material Reissue? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's one of the first times I haven't bugged anybody to let me play with them. I, it's just one of my things. I like asking people if I could play with them or uh, can we record or can we do something. I like I like playing with other people a lot and uh, I didn't I didn't I didn't know that they were doing another show and um, Mike asked me, he said that Ted brought it up at uh, one of their practices mm -hmm. about me about me playing second guitar because uh, Jay O'Rourke uh, wasn't available for the New Year's gig so they asked me I, was, I, was flip, I flipped out I thought I was, I was very very excited about it to say the least very cool <laughs> to be oh. asked by them you know I mean I, I've, been, I've been a fan of the band since 91 oh yeah but it's surreal it's kind of you know surreal I was going to say, I mean, I, I know you've known Ted forever and, and Mike, but, I mean, how did your name even come up for a discussion? Well, I, I used to play with Ted. Um, I think I played in his uh, band, Ted and Sonny Project. I played with him for about a year. Okay. Uh, I think back in 2002 or 2003, he asked me to play in his band, and I did. And so, and he knew me from uh, back in the, the different days of the uh, second album we did. And we asked him to play bass on it, and uh, so that was kind of like the uh, the introduction, you know. Nice. Play on our record, Ted, and he did, and uh, so so through those two steps, that's you know how I, I know him, and he knows I'm a great uh, admirer of the band, you know, love the songs and the whole everything they did, the whole they had the whole enchilada as a as a group, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I met Mike through. Um, Playing with him and Ted, and this uh, this this guy came to Chicago and, and wanted to uh, form a band around himself, and so I he somehow he got Mike and Ted and myself involved. So that didn't um, well, you don't have anything good to say about something, don't say anything. So I won't. But through that experience, uh, I got to you know know Mike and and play with them, and we all you know we all hit it off musically, and and you know. I wasn't so much a, a fan anymore. I was just, you know, kind of like just another guy playing music with them, you know? Mm -hmm. I remember going to at least, it was either your show or, or a, a safe show where Ted was there just watching the show, and I remember him at the bar talking to you guys just without even thinking about it and sharing the secrets of material issue success I mean I, as a fan from the outside you could tell how hard they worked they played every gig didn't turn a single gig down drove wherever they had to and the fact that he was so friendly and willing to share that information with you guys was just I mean knocked me out I mean because other bands were like yeah okay whatever who are you yeah <laughs> yeah, th th yeah Ted loves um, loves uh, reminiscing he loves uh sharing, you know, mm -hmm. in every capacity, you know, musically and uh, the, the uh, material issues, uh, you know, career, like every every experience that they had, he, he likes to talk about it, and um, it's still valid, you know, it's not that long ago, but he, you know, he's, well, he really, what, I don't know what I'm trying to say, he, he's trying to, he's, he likes to, to connect with people who connected with the band, and he likes to be forthright about his experiences with the group. And it's it's an amazing thing just to you know think that they were from here, and uh, that short period of time they they were really skyrocketing somewhere. Something happened on the way to bigger things, but it, is, it does, really doesn't make any difference to me personally. Uh, they uh, they touched me um, like all all the great. Bands that I, I love and still love, you know, it touched me. They had everything. They had the singles. They had the B sides. They had the albums. You know, there was very little filler. They, were, you know, and they and like you said, they worked really hard at it. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm not that ambitious. Those guys were really, <laughs> those guys really, you know, went 100 miles an hour 
Warren had a goal and you know, purpose and a point, and Jim was a big, you know, the, pretty much the guy who was like, he had the flame, he, 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 he had the purpose, the point, he had the tunes, and those guys were right there with him, and, you know, you know, often get to have a band that's just a three-piece and that just all those parts work so well together. I know they know that now. I think they knew it then, but, you know, the most interesting thing to be talking about with them now is how they're listening to the records for the 20th anniversary, you know, shows that they were going to do and really realizing what a great group they were. Oh, yeah. Um, and to, Mike, to, was saying, Mike was saying to me, uh, uh, I think last practice, that he's, uh, you know, he plays better. He's uh, still hits hard, but he's, you know, a better, more experienced drummer. Which, you know, I agree with. You know, you know, everybody I know who plays, you know, since we were playing since we were like eighteen, mm-hmm. thirteen or eighteen, I think we're all we're still doing it. Which a lot of people I know are, mm-hmm. all just, you know, more experienced and, and better, better player. Mm-hmm. I mean, that yeah. They, I'm sorry. They, they work really hard. You're right. You know, that's. I remember you. Remember him saying that stuff to us, talking about how much they put into it. Yeah, it was like a gig at Morseland or, or or Emerald Isle or something. And I just remember him being so generous with his time. And for him, it was like nothing doing. Yeah, it's like showing a band at a you know not as high of a stature as they were at the time uh, how they did it and how they how they made it happen. And that's one thing. I mean, just in my own experiences, hearing every single Jim story I hear is. It's obvious that the man was dedicated 110% to making this happen. I mean, not only is the music there, but, I mean, he just was tireless in saying, we're the best and we're going to be big. And, you know, yeah. God bless yeah. him, he was right. That's Well, that's the thing. You, you, you have that attitude and you have the goods, too, um, which they did, you know, and it was, it was cooking. It was going places. It, they, they opened up the doors here for this town. You know, I remember, you know, vividly being 18 years old in 1991, and, and that record was huge here. Mm-hmm. And um, everybody was digging on it. And, and we were all, everybody that I knew that was in, in, in bands, and at the time there wasn't that many people I knew, um, besides me, maybe a, you know, half a dozen or a dozen people. Mm-hmm. But we all were really jazzed by the fact that these guys were, you know, local, and um, and we're playing like you know pop songs, like short three minute songs that had these incredible hooks, these incredible choruses. You know, lyrics were were fantastic, and they just get better with age. Now, you know, listening to them still, it, it's just it's they uh, they've aged well. Mm-hmm. Um, but see, it's all those things, like all all those things happening at the right place, the right time, and the right years here. Mm-hmm. And then, I, it, for some reason, they just they just they they kind of I don't know. They had a, a following that stuck with them, but they didn't seem to like break any any bigger, or you didn't see them on on more MTV exposure, or you know you didn't hear them on certain radio stations. So mm-hmm. it just kind of like seemed to just level out and didn't go anywhere and, and, but the music got better like the third album is my favorite Freak City oh yeah absolutely myself too I mean yeah you the hear first that, two are that, special there's a band that's really cooking now they're really they're really happening the first two albums are really special to me um, but that third album with I don't know if it was Mike Chapman producing a change yeah, of venue yeah. for a studio or what but they're they just smoke it they they're, they take no prisoners on that album, and they really take... When you listen to the demo forms of those songs that came out versus what they eventually became in the studio, I mean, it, they just took it to the next level. It was incredible. I know it's such a cliche, but it's so true. Well, no, well, usually cliches are true, and that's the thing. I think talking with uh, Mike and Ted about it, I, you know, I've several times I'd ask them questions about that record and what it was like to make it, and... and the basic gist I got from them was that it was very loose. Um, yeah, I got that. Mike Mike Chapman really liked them playing um, together, and he really liked them playing drunk. <laughs> That's what I heard about. He, yeah, he at the really recording, like, want them to be, you know, drinking or. <laughs> at the recording, the first album in Z- the first two albums in Zion with Jeff Murphy the sh- of Shoes and Zion's as dry a town as they get. 
uh, yeah, I, I heard about that, that they were drunk all the time for, for that third album, and I don't know if it's the drunk or whatever, but it, they just seem looser, and they just seem take no prisoners. There's nothing tentative about that third album. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's something else. I, that thing should have been huge. That should have been like, because I never, whenever I listen to that record, I don't start mm -hmm. at one spot. I start at the beginning and listen to the whole thing. Oh, yeah. And that's like the first thing I turn, if you know, if someone doesn't know the band, I'll, I'll play that one first. Just It was funny, I played uh, International Pop Over Throw for my wife, and she gave me this look like, we're going to see this band? And I said, hold on a second. And I popped in Freak City Soundtrack. She's like, okay, now I can see what's going on. And I think that was the gateway for her. She ended up getting into them, hearing that first, and then she turned, you know, went back and ended up liking some of the stuff out the first album. Yeah, yeah. It, that's, see, that's a great um, tool. You just described a great way to, to um, break a band in with people, is to kind of play them something and then see, and, and see their reaction and then maybe go with something else to, you know, kind of steer them steer their steer their interest in, in the band, you know, in the way you see fit. Oh, yeah. So, moving on, uh, give us a quick musical resume for the, for the few people out there who actually haven't seen you live and don't know how great of a musician you are. What bands have you played with around what time and in what capacity? Um, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Like I said, I've been, I, I started playing in bands in 1989, so I was actually <laughs> in it, playing live music with people in, uh, in the 80s. Okay. It's kind of weird to say. You had to have been, you and I are the same age, so you had to have been what? Uh, what? 17? Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. Okay. Yeah. And we were practicing, uh, I was practicing out with uh, these, uh, you know, at the time, my oldest friend next door and I would drive out to the Hoffman Estates every Saturday and, and play covers with these guys and uh, the Lopez brothers and Max Jordan and me and, and we had like four different names and eventually the original started being thrown in the mix and that group didn't last, you know, it lasted under a year. But that's that's where I got my feet wet with, um, with playing music with other people and just fell in love with that, as well as playing along with records and CDs and stuff, I've just I just enjoy playing with uh, a unit with with other people. Mm -hmm. And um, from there, um, I formed uh, the difference with uh, some guys from high school that evolved into um, Park Ridgian people, like the O'Malley brothers and Dan Garrity, and uh, they got him and me together, and we. We forged ahead for a good number of years, put out two records. Um, then I played with some other people, some of this gentleman, uh, Glenn Wall, who lives in New York now. We were the disappointments, and then <laughs> in the last 10 years, I was playing with uh, Gary Steer and the Sleepless Nights. I learned a lot from Gary and, and those guys, and the dorks, and the turn to Penthouse Suites, who I'm playing with now, and Pete uh, Palish, Andy Hansen, and Chris Gotch, and Lauren Guzik now and and Eric Cheel on bass. I mean, I, it's it's just a. I think it's a, been a really healthy progression of meeting people and playing with them, and 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 I'm you know always excited about what's happening next. But I'm really happy with you know whoever I played with in the last fifteen plus years. I'm, I'm, it's been great. And I've learned so much so much from all these great dudes. It's really corny. Nope. Great dudes, but yeah, I learn a lot from playing with. Uh, the more people I've played with, the better a player I think I've become. The less, um, the less is more, and then you know, play for the song and, and listen for that. You know, play in the pocket like a like a drummer would, or like a bass player when 